Coming at you today to talk about what kind of revocable or irrevocable trusts allow you to qualify for long-term care Medicaid and avoid losing money and assets to the nursing home. My name is Paul Rabelais. I'm an estate planning attorney. Uh, I work out of our great state of Louisiana. This is an area, and I mention that because every state's Medicaid provisions can be a little bit different. So if you're not in Louisiana, you may get the general idea here, but, but don't rely on this information. You want to make sure you talk to somebody who's well-versed in your state's Medicaid eligibility rules. Anyway, let's get right to it. Uh, one of the most misunderstood topics out there, um, people come to me and sit down with me and they come to talk to me about making sure all of their estate legal affairs in order. They're, they're getting them in order. They've done some things in the past. They haven't done anything. Some circumstances have changed. Uh, they're worried about new things. So sometimes they come in and some people already have done some legal work in the past and they might say, you know, I have a trust, so everything's protected from the nursing home. So then I have to say, well, not so fast. Let's look at the specific provisions of the trust. So um, really when you break it down or when most people break it down, they can break it down into two different kinds of trusts. There are revocable trusts that start with an R and there's irrevocable trusts that start with an I. So let's look at what the differences are between the two. First one, we'll start with the one that's pretty simple, at least in so far as potential Medicaid qualification if you enter a nursing home. So the first one I'll talk about is the revocable trust. I always like to refer to our state's provisions of its Medicaid eligibility manual, which I have right here. You can kind of see what's going on there, but. Uh, which many, many, many provisions, I'm just touching on a couple. Again, don't do this at home. So, but the treatment of revocable trusts is addressed in a provision that says the entire corpus of a revocable trust is counted as an available resource to the individual. Let's break that down. The entire corpus of a, of a revocable trust is counted as an available resource to the, to the individual. The entire corpus says corpus, nobody knows what that means. Corpus really, the more common term for corpus is, is the trust principle, P-A-L at the end. Uh, or you might just say the trust assets. So the entire trust corpus, the principle, the assets of a revocable trust, if the trust is a revocable trust, it's counted as an available resource to the individual. Available resource means you gotta spend it before you can qualify for Medicaid. The individual is the person who would be qualifying for Medicaid or their spouse. So pretty cut and dry there. If you got a revocable trust and you got assets in it, not gonna, get, not gonna do you any good for Medicaid purposes. So some people say, well, why would anyone have a revocable trust? Well, revocable trusts have never been used for long-term care Medicaid qualifications. They are used extensively for the uh, scenario where people wanna retain 100% control over what they have, but, uh, keep their survivors from having to go through that court supervised probate or what we call in Louisiana succession procedure. And quite frankly, when those revocable living trusts are set up right and, and everything is titled in the trust that needs to be in the trust, they're funded correctly. And I've done you know, lots of videos on that. When it's all set up right, uh, you know, it's a beautiful thing. It works well. In fact, you know, I really love it when the survivors come in and say, boy, my parents, they had a trust. Uh, everything was so seamless. Everything was distributed, you know, right after my parents passed away to, to the kids. We didn't have to go see an attorney. We didn't have to go through court. It, I'm really glad my parents did that. So, so it does work well in those revocable trusts and allowing people to retain control over, over what they have, but set up their estate so that all of that court and attorney involvement, expense, and delay, all of that government intrusion is 100% eliminated You know when, when the person passes away. All right, so there's your revocable trust summary. Now let's go to the second piece, a little more complicated. It's the irrevocable trust, IRR and so forth. Not every irrevocable trust gives you nursing home protection. Some people make the false statement. Revocable, not protected. Irrevocable, protected. Not quite that simple. So go, gotta go to the provisions of the Louisiana Medicaid Eligibility Manual, which address the treatment of irrevocable trusts. 
one of the provisions, the one that's probably most relevant, says the portion of the corpus that could be paid to or for the benefit of the individual is treated as a resource available to the individual. Okay, so let's break that down. Portion of the corpus that could be paid to or for the benefit of the individual is treated as a resource available to the individual. So if some of that, if that trust corpus could be dispersed to the person who set up the trust or to the individual who's applying for Medicaid, then um, it's going to be treated as a resource that's got to be spent. And I, I, want to, I want to get to the example because it's a pretty good example. I'm piecing together a couple of examples from the Medicaid manual. And, it, and the example says that Mr. Baker establishes an irrevocable trust with a corpus of $100,000 on March 1st, 2006. Then it goes on to say that about three months later, June 15th, 2006, the trustee distributes $50,000 of the corpus to Mr. Baker's brother. And then in 2009, November 15th, 2009, uh, Mr. Baker enters a nursing facility. And on February 15th of 2010, Mr. Baker applies for Medicaid. So what are the consequences of all of that? So the consequences are that, um, and by the way, that trust instrument provides that the trustee is prohibited um, by the trust from dispersing any of the corpus of the trust to or for Mr. Baker. So the example in the Medicaid manu manual goes on to provide that because none of the corpus can be dispersed to Mr. Baker, the entire value of the corpus at the time the trust was created, $100,000, is treated as a transfer of resources for less than fair market value. So that was probably his intended goal is to get it treated as a transfer back in 2006. Uh, so that five year period would start. The trust is not an available resource of Mr. Baker that would have to be spent. Okay, and by the way, it goes on to say that that uh, June 15th, 2006, trustee disperses $50,000 of corpus to Mr. Baker's brother. The manual goes on and the example goes on to state that the $50,000 given to Mr. Baker's brother does not alter the amount of the transfer on, on, upon which the penalty is based. So the fact that that the $100,000 was put into the irrevocable trust by Mr. Baker and the trust prohibited the trustee from dispersing any of the corpus to or for Mr. Baker, that did it. That the fact that there was a subsequent distribution from the trust to Mr. Baker's brother doesn't factor into Mr. Baker's Medicaid eligibility. A little bit surprised they used a distribution to a brother because often what we see around the country is that, you know, Mr. Baker's children are what's called the principal beneficiaries of the trust. And then the trustee is permitted to make a distribution of corpus or principal from the trust to one of the principal beneficiaries, perhaps Mr. Baker's children, who are um, intended to receive the trust assets when Mr. Baker dies. In fact, that's the way that these things often get set up just in case Mr. Baker wants to undo the whole thing or get some of the money back. The trustee can make a disbursement to one of his children, one of the principal beneficiaries. Again, if all of the trust is worded just right and then the child, once they receive the disbursement, they can do what they want to with it so they could voluntarily give it back to their father. So, but that's a whole nother discussion. Warning number five, don't try this at home. You gotta get good help. You gotta plan ahead. Getting it right the first time is really important. So um, hope this helps give you some framework that revocable trusts used extensively for probate avoidance purposes, keeping everything in the family, avoiding uh, government and court involvement when someone dies, doesn't protect from the nursing homes, irrevocable trust. Got to look to the provisions of the irrevocable trust. One of the provisions that is important to Medicaid qualifications is that uh, no portion of the corpus can be, uh, could be uh, dispersed to the individual 
to or for the individual. So um, hope that helps. Um, yeah, if you live in Louisiana and you want, you have concerns about that and you want to start a conversation about what's the simplest ways to protect what you have, maybe you're in your 60s, maybe you're in your 70s, and you're starting to realize that you're not gonna live forever and you don't wanna go to the nursing home but you wanna be protected just in case, may wanna contact our office with a phone call, 866-491-3884. Um, in another state outside of Louisiana, find someone who is well-versed in the whole estate planning, Medicaid eligibility, often called elder law, the tax consequences, the property transfers, gotta get, um, you know, work with someone who's well versed in all of that, which by putting, you know, by saying that you have to work with someone who's well versed in all of that, you've just, we've just eliminated about 99.8% of the attorney population. But there are people in every, you know, in every city that uh, help others um, get these things in order. So take advantage of that. Hope that helps. I'm Paul Rabelais. Have a great day.